the Mahabharat of Krishna Dvipayana Vyasa. Translated into English prose from the original Sanskrit text by Pratap Chandra Roy CIE. This free ebook has been downloaded from holybooks.com. Viratha Purva. Section 49, Guharana Purva continued. Kripa said, O Radeya, thy crooked heart always inclineth to war. Thou knowest not the true nature of things, nor dost thou take into account thereafter consequences. There are various kinds of expedients inferable from the scriptures. Of these, a battle heart being regarded by those acquainted with the past, as the most sinful. It is only when time and place are favorable that military operations can lead to success. In the present instance however, the time being unfavorable, no good results will be derived. A display of prowess in proper time and place becometh beneficial. It is by the favorableness or otherwise of time and place that the opportuneness of an act is determined. Learned men can never act according to the ideas of a car maker. Considering all this, an encounter with Partha is not advisable for us. Alone he saved the Kurus from the Gandavas, and alone he satiated Agni. Alone he led the life of a Brahmacharin for five years on the breast of Himavat. Taking up Subhadra on his car, alone he challenged Krishna to single combat. Alone he fought with Rudra who stood before him as a forester. It was in this very forest that Pata rescued Krishna while she was being taken away by Jayadratha. It is he alone that heart for five years, studied the science of weapons under Indra. Alone vanquishing all force he heart spread the fame of the Kurus. Alone that chastiser of force vanquished in battle Chitrasena, the king of the Gandavas and in a moment his invincible troops also. Alone he overthrew in battle the fierce Nivatakavachas and the Kalakanchas, that were both incapable of being slain by the gods themselves. What however O Kurna, hath been achieved by these single-handed like any of the sons of Pandu, each of whom had alone subjugated many lords of earth. Even Indra himself is unfit to encounter Pata in battle. He therefore that desired to fight with Arjuna should take a sedative. As to thyself, thou desirest to take out the fangs of an angry snake of virulent poison by stretching forth thy right hand and extending thy forefinger. Or wandering alone in the forest thou desirest to ride an infuriate elephant and go to a boar without a hook in hand. Or rubbed over with clarified butter and dressed in silken robes, thou desirest to pass through the midst of a blazing fire fed with fat and tallow and clarified butter. Who is there that would, binding his own hands and feet and tying a huge stone unto his neck, cross the ocean swimming with his bare arms? What manliness is there in such an act? O Kurna, he is a fool that would without skill in weapons and without strength, desire to fight with Pata who is so mighty and skilled in weapons. Dishonestly deceived by us and liberated from thirteen years exile, will not the illustrious hero annihilate us? Having ignorantly come to a place where Pata lay concealed like fire hidden in a well, we have indeed been exposed to a great danger. But irresistible though he be in battle, we should fight against him. Let therefore our troops clad in mail, stand here arrayed in ranks and ready to strike. Let Drona and Duryodhana and Bhishma and thyself and Drona's son and ourselves, all fight with the son of Pritha. Do not O Kurna, act so rashly as to fight alone. If we six warriors be united we can then be a match for and fight with that son of Pritha who is resolved to fight and who is as fierce as the wielder of the thunderbolt. Aided by our troops arrayed in ranks, ourselves great bowmen standing carefully will fight with Arjuna even as the Denavas encounter Vasava in battle. Thus ends the 49th section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 50, Guharana Purva continued. Aswathaman said, the Kinokarna have not yet been won, nor have they yet crossed the boundary of their owner's dominions. Nor have they yet reached Hastinapura. 
Why dost thou therefore boast of thyself? Having won numerous battles and acquired enormous wealth, and vanquished hostile hosts, men of true heroism speak not a word of their prowess. Fire burneth mutely and mutely doth the sunshine. Mutely also doth the earth bear creatures, both mobile and immobile. The self-existent heart sanctioned such offices for the four orders that having recourse to them each may acquire wealth without being censurable. A Brahmana one having studied the waves, should perform sacrifices himself, and officiate at the sacrifices of others. And a Kshatriya, depending upon the Bo, should perform sacrifices himself but should never officiate at the sacrifices of others. And of Vaisya, having earned wealth, should cause the rites enjoined in the Vedas to be performed for himself. A Sudra should always wait upon and serve the other three orders. As regards those that live by practicing the profession of fowlers and vendors of meat, they may earn wealth by expedients fraught with deceit and fraud. Always acting according to the dictates of the scriptures, the exalted sons of Pandu acquired the sovereignty of the whole earth and they always act respectfully towards their superiors. Even if the latter prove hostile to them, what Kshatriya is there that expresses delight at having obtained a kingdom by means of dice, like this wicked and shameless son of Dhritarashtra? Having acquired wealth in this way by deceit and fraud like a vendor of meat, who that is wise would boast of it? In what single combat didst thou vanquish the Nanjaya, or Nakula, or Sahadeva, although thou hast robbed them of their wealth? In what battle didst thou defear Yudhishthirai or Bhima that foremost of strong men? In what battle was Indraprastha conquered by thee? What thou hast done however O thou of wicked deeds, is to drag that princess to court while she was ill and had but one raiment on. Thou hast cut the mighty root, delicate as the sandal, of the Pandava tree. Actuated by desire of wealth, when thou madest the Pandavas act as slaves, rememberest thou what Vidura said. We see that men and others, even insects and ants, show forgiveness according to their power of endurance. The son of Pandu however is incapable of forgiving the sufferings of Draupadi. Surely, Dhananjaya cometh here for the destruction of the sons of Dhritarashtra. It is true, affecting great wisdom, Thou art for making speeches but will not Vibhatsu that slayer of force exterminate us all. If it be gods, or Gandavas or Ashras, or Rakshasas, will the Nanjaya the son of Kunti, desist to fight from panic. Inflamed with wrath upon whomsoever he will fall, even him he will overthrow like a tree under the weight of Gadura. Superior to thee in prowess, in bowmanship equal unto the Lord himself of the Celestials, and in battle equal unto Vasudeva himself, who is there that would not praise Partha? Counteracting celestial weapons with celestial, and human weapons with human, what man is a match for Arjuna? Those acquainted with the scriptures declare that a disciple is in no way inferior to a son, and it is for this that the son of Pandu is a favorite of Drona. Employ thou the means now which thou hadst adopted in the match at dice, the same means, viz, by which thou hadst subjugated Indraprastha, and the same means by which thou hadst dragged Krishna to the assembly. This thy wise uncle, fully conversant with the duties of the Kshatriya order, this deceitful gambler Sakuni, the prince of Gandhara, let him fight now. The Gandiva however doth not cast dice such as the Krita or the Dvapara, but it shooteth upon force blazing and keen-edged shafts by myriads. The fierce arrows shot from the Gandiva, endued with great energy and furnished with vulturine wings, can pierce even mountains. The destroyer of all, named Yama, and Vayu, and the horse-faced Agni, leave some remnant behind, but the Nanjaya inflamed with wrath never doth so. As thou hadst, aided by thy uncle, played a dice in the assembly so do fight in this battle protected by Suvila's son. Let the preceptor, if he chooses fight. I shall not however fight with the Nanjaya. 
We are to fight with the king of the Matsyas if indeed he commit in the track of the kin. Thus ends the 58th section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 51, Guharana Purva continued. Bhishma said, Drona's son observe it well, and Kripa too observe it rightly. As for Karna, it is only out of regard for the duties of the Kshatriya order that he desired to fight. No man of wisdom can blame the preceptor. I however am of opinion that fight we must, considering both the time and the place. Why should not that man be bewildered who heart five adversaries effulgent as five sons, who are heroic combatants and who have just emerged from adversity? Even those conversant with morality are bewildered in respect of their own interests. It is for this O King that I tell thee this, whether my words be acceptable to you or not. What Karna said unto thee was only for raising our drooping courage. As regards thyself O preceptor's son, forgive everything. The business at hand is very grave. When the son of Kunti hath come, this is not the time for quarrel. Everything should now be forgiven by thyself and the preceptor Kripa. Like light in the sun, the mastery of all weapons doth reside in you. As beauty is never separated from Chandramas, so are the Vedas and the Brahma weapon both established in you. It is often seen that the four Vedas dwell in one object and Kshatriya attributes in another. We have never heard of these two dwelling together in any other person than the preceptor of the Bharata race and his son. Even this is what I think. In the Vedantas, in the Puranas, and in old histories, who, save Chamdagni, O King, would be Drona's superior. A combination of the Brahma weapon with the Vedas, this is never to be seen anywhere else. O Preceptor's son, do thou forgive. This is not the time for disunion. Let all of us, uniting, fight with Indra's son who hath come. Of all the calamities that may befall an army that have been enumerated by men of wisdom, the worst is disunion among the leaders. Aswataman said, O bull among men, these digest observations need not be uttered in our presence, the preceptor however, filled with wrath, had spoken of Arjuna's virtues. The virtues of even an enemy should be admitted, while the faults of even one's preceptor may be pointed out. Therefore one should, to the best of his power declare the merits of a son or a disciple. Duryodhana said, let the preceptor grant his forgiveness and let peace be restored. If the preceptor be at one with us, whatever should be done in view of the present emergency would seem to have been already done. Vesampayana continued, then O Bharata, Duryodhana assisted by Karna and Kripa and the high-souled Bhishma pacified Drona. Drona said, A piece I have already been at the words first spoken by Bhishma, the son of Santnu. Let such arrangements be made that Pata may not be able to approach Duryodhana in battle. And let such arrangements be made that King Duryodhana may not be captured by the foe, in consequence either of his rashness or want of judgment. Arjuna had not to be sure, revealed himself before the expiry of the term of exile. Nor will he pardon this act of ours today, having only recovered the kin. Let such arrangements therefore be made that he may not succeed in attacking Dhritarashtra's son and defeating our troops. Like myself, who am doubtful of the completion of period of exile, Duryodhana also had said so before. Bearing it in mind it behoveth the son of Ganga to say what is true. Thus ends the 51st section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 52, Guharana Purva continued. Bhishma said, the wheel of time revolves with its divisions, viz, with kolas and kastas and muhartas and days and fortnights and months and constellations and planets and seasons and years. In consequence of their fractional excesses and the deviations of also of the heavenly bodies, there is an increase of two months in every five years. It seems to me that calculating this wise, there would be an excess of five months and twelve nights in thirteen years. 
everything therefore that the sons of Pandu had promised, hath been exactly fulfilled by them. Knowing this to be certain, Vibhatsu hath made his appearance. All of them are high-souled and fully conversant with the meanings of the scriptures. How would they deviate from virtue that have Yudhishthira for their guide? The sons of Kunti do not yield to temptation. They have achieved a difficult feat. If they had coveted the possession of their kingdom by unfair means, then those descendants of the Guru race would have sought to display their prowess at the time of the match at dice. Bound in bonds of virtue, they did not deviate from the duties of the Kshatriya order. He that will regard them to have behaved falsely will surely meet with defeat. The sons of Preetha would prefer death to falsehood. When the time however comes, those bulls among men, the Pandavas endued with energy like that of Sakra, would not give up what is theirs even if it is defended by the wielder himself of the thunderbolt. We shall have to oppose in battle the foremost of all wielders of weapons. Therefore let such advantageous arrangements as have the sanction of the good and the honest be now made without loss of time, so that our positions may not be appropriated by the foe. O King of Kings, O Korava, I have never seen a battle in which one of the parties could say, we are sure to win. When a battle occurs, there must be victory or defeat, prosperity or adversity. Without doubt, a party to a battle must have either of the two. Therefore O King of Kings, whether a battle be now proper or not, consistent with virtue or not, make thy arrangements soon for Dhananjaya is at hand. Duryodhana said, I will not O oh Grandsire, give back the Pandavas their kingdom. Let every preparation therefore for battle be made without delay. Bhishma said, Listen to what I regard as proper, if it pleases thee. I should always say what is for thy good, O oh Korava. Proceed thou towards the capital without loss of time, taking with thee a fourth part of the army. And let another fourth march, escorting the kin. With half the troops we will fight the Pandava. Myself and Drona and Karna and Aswathaman and Kripa will resolutely withstand Vibhatsu, or the king of the Matsyas, or Indra himself if he approaches. Indeed we will withstand any of these like the bank withstanding the surging sea. Vesampayana continued, these words spoken by the high-souled Bhishma were acceptable to them and the king of the Kauravas acted accordingly without delay. And having sent away the king and then the kin, Bhishma began to array the soldiers in order of battle. And addressing the preceptor, he said, O preceptor, stand thou in the center and let Aswathaman stand on the left and let the wise Kripa, son of Saradvata, defend the right wing and let Karna of the Sutta cast, clad in mail, stand in the van. I will stand in the rear of the whole army, protecting it from that point. Thus ends the 52nd section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 53, Guharana Purva continued. Vesampayana said, after the Kauravas of Bharata, had taken their stand in this order, Arjuna, filling the air with the rattle and din of his car advanced quickly towards them. And the Gurus beheld his banner top and heard the rattle and din of his car as also the twang of the Gandiva stretched repeatedly by him. And noting all this and seeing that great Kavoriya, the wielder of the Gandiva come, Drona spoke thus, that is the banner top of Partha, which shineth at a distance and this is the noise of his car and that is the ape that roareth frightfully. Indeed the ape strike it terror in the troops. And there stationed on that excellent car, the foremost of Kavoriya draw it that best of boss, the Gandiva, whose twang is as loud as the thunder. Behold these two shafts coming together fall at my feet and two others pass off barely touching my ears. Completing the period of exile and having achieved many wonderful feats, Partha salute at me and whisper it in my ears. Endued with wisdom and beloved of his relatives this Dhananjaya, the son of Pandu, is indeed beheld by us after a long time, blazing with beauty and grace. Possessed of car and arrows, 
furnished with handsome fences and quiver and conch and banner and coat of mail, decked with diadem and scimitar and bow, the son of Preetha shineth like the blazing Homa fire surrounded with sacrificial ladles and fed with sacrificial butter. Vesampayana continued, beholding the gurus ready for battle, Arjuna addressing Matsya's son in words suitable to the occasion said, O charioteer, restrain thou the steeds at such a point whence my arrows may reach the enemy. Meanwhile let me see where in the midst of this army, is that wild wretch of the Kuru race. Disregarding all these and singling out that vainest of princes, I will fall upon his head, for upon the defeat of that wretch the others will regard themselves as defeated. There standeth Drona, and thereafter him his son. And there are those great bowmen Bhishma and Kripa and Kurna. I do not see however the king there. I suspect that, anxious to save his life, he retreated by the southern road, taking away with him the kin. Leaving this array of cavaliers, proceed to the spot where Suyodhana is. There will I fight, O son of Viratha, for there the battle will not be fruitless. Defeating him I will come back, taking away the kin. Vesampayana continued, thus addressed, the son of Viratha restrained the steeds with an effort, and turned them by a pull at the bridle from the spot where those bulls of the Kuru race were, and urged them on towards the place where Duryodhana was. And as Sarjuna went away leaving that thick array of cars, Kripa, guessing his intention, addressed his own comrades saying, this Vibhatsu desired not to take up his stand at a spot remote from the king. Let us quickly fall upon the flanks of the advancing hero. When inflamed with wrath, none else unassisted can encounter him in battle save the deity of a thousand eyes, or Krishna the son of Devki. Of what use to us would the kin be or this vast wealth also, if Duryodhana were to sink like a boat in the ocean of Partha? Meanwhile Vibhatsu, having proceeded towards that division of the army, announced himself speedily by name, and covered the troops with his arrows thick as locusts. And covered with those countless shafts shot by Partha, the hostile warriors could not see anything, the earth itself and the sky becoming overwhelmed therewith. And the soldiers who had been ready for the fight were so confounded that none could even flee from the field. And beholding the light-handedness of Partha they all applauded it mentally. And Arjuna then blew his conch which always made the bristles of the foe stand erect. And twanging his best of boss, he urged the creatures on his flagstaff to roar more frightfully. And at the blare of his conch and the rattle of his car wheels, and the twang of the Gandiva, and the roar of the superhuman creatures stationed on his flagstaff, the earth itself began to tremble. And shaking their oppressed tails and lowing together, Dakin turned back, proceeding along the southern road. Thus ends the 53rd section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 54, Guharana Purva continued. Vesampayana said, having disorganized the hostile host by force and having recovered Dakin, that foremost of bowmen, desirous of fighting again, proceeded towards Duryodhana. And beholding the kin running wild towards the city of the Matsyas, the foremost warriors of the Gurus regarded Kiritin to have already achieved success. And all on a sudden they fell upon Arjuna who was advancing towards Duryodhana. And beholding their countless divisions firmly arrayed in order of battle with countless banners waving over them, that slayer of foes, addressing the son of the king of the Matsyas, said, urge on, to the best of their speed by this road, these white steeds decked with golden bridles. Strive thou well, for I would approach this crowd of Kuru lions. Like an elephant desiring an encounter with another, the Sutha's son of wicked so eagerly desireth a battle with me. Take me O prince, to him who hath grown so proud under the patronage of Duryodhana. Thus addressed, the son of Virata by means of those large steeds endued with the speed of the wind and furnished with golden armor, broke that array of cars and took the Pandava into the midst of the battlefield. And seeing this those mighty car warriors, 
Chitrasena and Sangramajit and Satru Saha and Jaya, desirous of aiding Karna, rushed with arrows and long shafts, towards the advancing hero of Bharata's race. Then that foremost of men, inflamed with wrath, began to consume by means of fiery arrows shot from his bow, that array of cars belonging to those bulls among the Kurus, like a tremendous conflagration consuming a forest. Then, when the battle began to rage furiously, the Kuru hero, Vikarna, mounted on his car, approached that foremost of car warriors, Pata, the younger brother of Bhima, showering upon him terrible shafts thick and long. Then cutting Vikarna's bow furnished with a tough string and horns overlaid with gold, Arjuna cut off his flag staff. And Vikarna, beholding his flag staff cut off, speedily took to flight. And after Vikarna's flight, Satruntapa, unable to repress his ire, began to afflict Pata, that obstructor of force and achiever of superhuman feats, by means of a perfect shower of arrows. And drowned, as it were, in the midst of the Kuruare, Arjuna pierced by that mighty Kavarya, King Satruntapa pierced the latter in return with five and then slew his car driver with ten shafts, and pierced by that bull of the Bharata race with an arrow capable of cleaving the thickest coat of mail, Satruntapa fell dead on the field of battle, like a tree from a mountain top torn up by the wind. And those brave bulls among men, mangled in battle by that braver bull among men, began to waver and tremble like mighty forests shaken by the violence of the wind that blows at the time of the universal dissolution. And struck in battle by Pata, the son of Vasava, those well-dressed heroes among men, those givers of wealth endued with the energy of Vasava defeated and deprived of life, began to measure their lengths on the ground, like full-grown Himalayan elephants clad in males of black steel decked with gold and like unto a raging fire consuming a forest at the close of summer, that foremost of men wielding the Gandiva, ranged the field in all directions, slaying his force in battle thus. And as the wind ranged at will, scattering masses of clouds and fallen leaves in the season of spring, so did that foremost of Kavariya's Kiritin ranged in that battle, scattering all his force before him and soon slaying the red steeds yoked unto the car of Sangramajit, the brother of Vikartna's son, that hero decked in diadem and endued with great vigor then cut off his antagonist's head by a crescent-shaped arrow. And when his brother was slain, Vikartna's son of the Sutta caste, mustering all his prowess, rushed at Arjuna, like a huge elephant with outstretched tusks, or like a tiger at a mighty bull. And the son of Vikarna quickly pierced the son of Pandu with twelve shafts and all his steeds also in every part of their bodies and Virata's son too in his hand. And rushing impetuously against Vikarna's son who was suddenly advancing against him, Kiritin attacked him fiercely like Gadura of variegated plumage swooping down upon a snake. And both of them were foremost of bowmen and both were endued with great strength and both were capable of slaying force. And seeing that an encounter was imminent between them, the Kauravas anxious to witness it, stood aloof as lookers on. And beholding the offender Karna, the son of Pandu, excited to fury and glad also at having him, soon made him, his horses, his car, and car driver invisible by means of a frightful shower of countless arrows. And the warriors of the Bharatas headed by Bhishma, with their horses, elephants, and cars, pierced by Kiritin and rendered invisible by means of his shafts, their ranks also scattered and broken, began to wail aloud in grief. The illustrious and heroic Karna, however counteracting with numberless arrows of his own those shafts by Arjuna's hand, soon burst forth in view with bow and arrows like a blazing fire. And then there arose the sound of loud clapping of hands, with the blare of conches and trumpets and kettle drums made by the gurus while they applauded Vikartna's son who filled the atmosphere with the sound of his bowstring flapping against his fence. And beholding Kiritin filling the air with the twang of the Gandiva and the appraised tail of the monkey that constituted his flag and that terrible creature yelling furiously from the top of his flag staff, 
Karna sent forth a loud roar. And afflicting by means of his shafts, Vikartna's son along with his steeds, car and car driver, Kiritin impetuously poured an arrowy shower on him, casting his eyes on the grandsire and Drona and Kripa. And Vikartna's son also poured upon Pata a heavy shower of arrows like a rain-charged cloud. And the diadem decked Arjuna also covered Karna with a thick downpour of keen-edged shafts. And the two heroes stationed on their cars, creating clouds of keen-edged arrows in a combat carried on by means of countless shafts and weapons, appeared to the spectators like the sun and the moon covered by clouds, and the light-handed Karna, unable to bear the sight of the foe, pierced the four horses of the diadem-decked hero with wetted arrows, and then struck his car driver with three shafts, and his flag staff also with three. Thus struck, that grinder of all adversaries in battle, that bull of the Kuru race, Jishnu wielding the Gandiva, like a lion awaked from slumber, furiously attacked Karna by means of straight-going arrows. And afflicted by the arrowy shower, of Karna, that illustrious achiever of superhuman deeds soon displayed a thick shower of arrows in return. And he covered Karna's car with countless shafts like the sun covering the different worlds with rays. And like a lion attacked by an elephant, Arjuna, taking some keen crescent-shaped arrows from out of his quiver and drawing his bow to his ear, pierced the Sutta's son on every part of his body. And that grinder of force pierced Karna's arms and thighs and head and forehead and neck and other principal parts of his body with wetted shafts and endued with the impetuosity of the thunderbolt and shot from the Gandiva in battle. And mangled and afflicted by the arrows shot by Pata the son of Pandu, Vikartna's son, quitted the van of battle, and quickly took to flight, like one elephant vanquished by another. Thus ends the 54th section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 55, Guharana Purva continued. Vesampayana said, after the son of Radha had fled from the field, other warriors headed by Duryodhana, one after another, fell upon the son of Pandu with their respective divisions. And like the sore withstanding the fury of the surging sea, that warrior withstood the rage of that countless host rushing towards him, arrayed in order of battle and showering clouds of arrows. And that foremost of car warriors, Kunti's son Vibhatsu of white steeds, rushed towards the foe, discharging celestial weapons all the while. Parta soon covered all the points of the horizon with countless arrows shot from the Gandiva, like the sun covering the whole earth with his rays. And amongst those that fought on cars and horses and elephants, and amongst the mail-clad foot soldiers, there was none that had on his body a space of even two fingers breadth unwound with sharp arrows. And for his dexterity in applying celestial weapons, and for the training of the steeds and the skill of Uta, and for the coursing of his weapons, and his prowess and light-handedness, people began to regard Arjuna as the fire that blazed forth during the time of the universal dissolution for consuming all created things. And none amongst the four could cast his eyes on Arjuna who shone like a blazing fire of great effulgence. And mangled by the arrows of Arjuna, the hostile ranks looked like newly risen clouds on the breast of a hill reflecting the solar rays, or like groves of Ahsoka trees resplendent with clusters of flowers. Indeed, afflicted by the arrows of Pata, the soldiers looked like these, or like a beautiful garland whose flowers gradually wither and drop away. And the all-pervading wind bore on its wings in the sky the torn flags and umbrellas of the hostile host. And affrighted at the havoc amongst their own ranks, the steeds fled in all directions, freed from their yokes by means of Pata's arrows and dragging after them broken portions of cars and elephants, struck on their ears and ribs and tusks and nether lips and other delicate parts of the body, began to drop down on the battlefield. And the earth, bestrewn in a short time with the corpses of elephants belonging to the Koravas, looked like the sky overcast with masses of black clouds. And as that fire of blazing flames at the end of the Yuga consumeth all perishable things of the world, both mobile and immobile, so did Pata, O King, 
consume all force in battle. And by the energy of his weapons and the twang of his bow, and the preternatural yells of the creatures stationed on his flagstaff, and the terrible roar of the monkey, and by the blast of his conch, that mighty grinder of force, Vibhatsu, struck terror into the hearts of all the troops of Duryodhana. And the strength of every hostile warrior seemed as it were, to be leveled to the dust at the very sight of Arjuna. And unwilling to commit the daring act of sin, of slaying them that were defenseless, Arjuna suddenly fell back and attacked the army from behind by means of clouds of keen-edged arrows proceeding towards their aims like hawks let off by fowlers. And he soon covered the entire welkin with clusters of blood-drinking arrows. And as the infinite rays of the powerful sun, entering a small vessel, are contracted within it for want of space, so the countless shafts of Arjuna could not find space for their expansion even within the vast welkin. Force were able to behold Arjuna's car, when near only once. For immediately after they were, with their horses, sent to the other world. And as his arrows unobstructed by the bodies of force always passed through them, so his car, unimpeded by hostile ranks, always passed through the latter. And indeed, he began to toss about and agitate the hostile troops with great violence like the thousand-headed Vasuki sporting in the great ocean. And as Kiritin incessantly shot his shafts, the noise of the bowstring, transcending every sound, was so loud that the like of it had never been heard before by created beings. And the elephants crowding the field, their bodies pierced with blazing arrows with small intervals between, looked like black clouds coruscated with solar rays. And ranging in all directions and shooting arrows right and left, Arjuna's bow was always to be seen drawn to a perfect circle, and the arrows of the wielder of the Gandiva never fell upon anything except the aim, even as the eye never dwelleth on anything that is not beautiful. And as the track of a herd of elephants marching through the forest is made of itself, so was the track was made of itself for the car of Kiritin. And struck and mangled by Partha, the hostile warriors thought that, verily Indra himself, desirous of Partha's victory, accompanied by all the immortals is slaying us. And they also regarded Vijaya, who was making a terrible slaughter around, to be none else than Death himself who having assumed the form of Arjuna, was slaying all creatures. And the troops of the Kurus, struck by Partha, were so mangled and shattered that the scene looked like the achievement of Partha himself and could be compared with nothing else save what was observable in Partha's combats. And he savoured the heads of force, ev as reapers cut off the tops of deciduous herbs. And the Kurus all lost their energy, owing to the terror begot of Arjuna. And tossed and mangled by the Arjuna gale, the forest of Arjuna's force redained the earth with purple secretions. And the dust mixed with blood, uplifted by the wind, made the very rays of the sun redder still. And soon the sun-decked sky became so red that it looked very much like the evening. Indeed the sun ceased to shed his rays as soon as he sets, but the son of Pandu ceased not to shoot his shafts. And that hero of inconceivable energy overwhelmed, by means of all celestial weapons, all the great bowmen of the enemy, although they were possessed of great prowess. And Arjuna then shot three and seventy arrows of sharp points at Drona, and ten at Dusaha and eight at Drona's son, and twelve at Dusasana, and three at Kripa, the son of Saradwat. And that slayer of force pierced Bhishma, the son of Santnu, with arrows, and King Duryodhana with a hundred. And lastly, he pierced Karna in the ear with a bearded shaft. And when that great bowman Karna, skilled in all weapons, was thus pierced and his horses and car and car driver were all destroyed, the troops that supported him began to break. And beholding those soldiers break and give way, the son of Virata desirous of knowing Partha's purpose, addressed him on the field of battle and said, O Partha, standing on this beautiful car with myself as charioteer, towards which division shall I go? For commanded by thee, 
I would soon take thee thither. Arjuna replied, O Uta, yonder auspicious warrior whom thou seest cased in coat of tiger skin and stationed on his car furnished with a blue flag and drawn by red steeds, is Kripa. There is to be seen the van of Kripa's division. Take me thither. I shall show that great bowman my swift-handedness in archery. And that warrior whose flag bearit the device of an elegant water pot worked in gold, is the preceptor drona that foremost of all wielders of weapons. He is always an object of regard with me, as also with all bearers of arms. Do thou therefore circumambulate that great hero cheerfully. Let us bend our heads there, for that is the eternal virtue. If Drona strikes my body first, then I shall strike him, for then he will not be able to resent it. There, close to Drona, that warrior whose flag bearit the device of a bow, is the preceptor's son, the great car warrior Aswataman, who is always an object of regard with me as also with every bearer of arms. Do thou therefore stop again and again, while thou comest by his car? There, that warrior who stayeth on his car, cased in golden mail and surrounded by a third part of the army consisting of the most efficient troops, and whose flag beareth the device of an elephant in a ground of gold, is the illustrious King Duryodhana, the son of Dhritarashtra. O hero, take before him this thy car that is capable of grinding hostile cars. This king is difficult of being vanquished in battle and is capable of grinding all force. He is regarded as the first of all Drona's disciples in lightness of hand. I shall in battle show him my superior swiftness in archery. There, that warrior whose flag bearit the device of a stout cord for binding elephants, is Kurna, the son of Vikatna already known to thee. When thou comest before that wicked son of Radha, be thou very careful, for he always challengeth me to an encounter. And that warrior whose flag is blue and bearit the device of five stars with a sun in the center, and who endured with great energy stayeth on his car holding a huge bow in hand and wearing excellent fences, and over whose head is an umbrella of pure white, who standeth at the head of a multitudinous array of cars with various flags and banners like the sun in advance of masses of black clouds and whose mail of gold looks bright as the sun or the moon, and who with his helmet of gold striketh terror into my heart, is Bhishma, the son of Santnu and the grandsire of us all. Entertained with regal splendor by Duryodhana, he is very partial and well affected towards that prince. Let him be approached last of all, for he may even now, be an obstacle to me. While fighting with me, do thou carefully guide the steeds. Thus addressed by him, Virata's son O king, guided Savir's chin's car with great alacrity towards the spot where Kripa stood anxious to fight. Thus ends the 55th section in the Goharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 56, Goharana Purva continued. Vesampayana said, and the ranks of those fierce bowmen, the Kurus, looked like masses of clouds in the rainy season drifting before a gentle wind. And close to those ranks of foot soldiers stood the enemy's horses ridden by terrible warriors. And there were also elephants of terrible mien, looking resplendent in beautiful armor, ridden by skilled combatants and urged on with iron cross and hooks. And O King, mounted on a beautiful car, Sakra came there accompanied by the Celestials, the Viswas and Maruths, and crowded with gods, Yakshas, Gandavas and Nagas, the firmament looked as resplendent as it does when bespangled with the planetary constellation in a cloudless night. And the celestials came there, each on his own car, desirous of beholding the efficacy of their weapons in human warfare, and for witnessing also the fierce and mighty combat that would take place when Bhishma and Arjuna would meet and embellished with gems of every kind and capable of going everywhere at the will of the rider, the heavenly car of the Lord of the Celestials, whose roof was upheld by a hundred thousand pillars of gold with a central one made entirely of jewels and gems, was conspicuous in the clear sky. 
and there appeared on the scene three and thirty gods with Vasava at their head and many Gandavas and Rakshasas and Nagas and Pitris, together with the great Rishis. And seated on the car of the Lord of the Celestials, appeared the effulgent persons of King, Vasumanas and Valakshas, and Supratardana and Ashtaka and Sivi, and Yayati and Nahusha and Gaya, and Manu and Puru and Raghu, and Banu and Kraizaswa and Sagara and Nala. And there shone in a splendid array, each in its proper place the cars of Agni and Isa, and Soma and Varuna, and Prajapati and Datri, and Vidatri and Kuvara and Yama, and Alamvusha and Ugrasena and others. And of the Gandava Tamburu. And all the Celestials and the Siddhas, and all the foremost of sages came there to behold that encounter between Arjuna and the Kurus. And the sacred fragrance of celestial garlands filled the air like that of blossoming woods at the advent of spring. And the red and reddish umbrellas and robes and garlands and chamaras of the gods, as they were stationed there, looked exceedingly beautiful. And the dust of the earth soon disappeared and celestial effulgence lit up everything. And redolent of divine perfumes, the breeze began to soothe the combatants. And the firmament seemed ablaze and exceedingly beautiful, decked with already arrived and arriving cars of handsome and various make, all illumined with diverse sorts of jewels, and brought thither by the foremost of the celestials. And surrounded by the celestials, and wearing a garland of lotuses and lilies the powerful wielder of the thunderbolt looked exceedingly beautiful on his car. And the slayer of Vala, Although he steadfastly gazed at his son on the field of battle, was not satiated with such gazing. Thus ends the 56th section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 57, Guharana Purva continued. Vesampayana said, Beholding the army of the Kuru arrayed in order of battle, that descendant of the Kuru race, Pata, addressing Virata's son said, do thou proceed to the spot where Kripa, the son of Saradwat, is going by the southern side of that car whose flag is seen to bear the device of a golden altar. Vesampayana continued, hearing these words of Dhananjaya, the son of Virata urged without a moment's delay, those steeds of silvery hue, decked in golden armor, and making them adopt, one after another, Every kind of the swifter paces he urged those fiery steeds resembling the moon in color. And worst in horse lore, Uttar having approached the Kuru host, turned back those steeds endued with the speed of the wind. And skilled in guiding vehicles, the prince of Matsya, sometimes wheeling about and sometimes proceeding in circular mazes and sometimes turning to the left, began to bewilder the Kurus. And wheeling round, the intrepid and mighty son of Virata at last approached the car of Kripa and stood confronting him. Then announcing his own name, Arjuna powerfully blew that best of conches called Devadatta, of loud blare. And blown on the field of battle by the mighty Jishnu, the blare of that conch was heard like the splitting of a mountain. And seeing that the conch did not break into a hundred fragments when blown by Arjuna, the Kurus with all their warriors began to applaud it highly. And having reached the very heavens, that sound coming back was heard even like the crash of the thunderbolt hurled by Magavat on the mountain breast. Thereupon that heroic and intrepid and mighty car warrior, Saradwat's son Kripa, endued with strength and prowess, waxing wrath at Arjuna, and unable to bear that sound and eager for fight, took up his own sea-begotten conch and blew it vehemently. And filling the three worlds with that sound, that foremost of car warriors took up a large bow and twanged the bowstring powerfully. And those mighty car warriors, equal unto two suns, standing opposed to each other, shone like two masses of autumnal clouds. Then Saradwat's son quickly pierced Partha, that slayer of hostile heroes, with ten swift and wetted arrows capable of entering into the very vitals. And Preetha's son also, on his part, drawing that foremost of weapons, the Gandiva, celebrated over the world, shot innumerable iron arrows, all capable of penetrating into the very core of the body. 
thereupon kripa by means of wetted shafts cut into hundreds and thousands of fragments those blood drinking arrows of parta before they could come up then that mighty kavarya parta also in wrath displaying various maneuvers covered all sides with a shower of arrows and covering the entire welkin with his shafts that mighty warrior of immeasurable soul the son of preetha enveloped kripa with hundreds of shafts and sorely afflicted by those wetted arrows resembling flames of fire kripa waxed wroth and quickly afflicting the high souled parta of immeasurable prowess with 10000 shafts set up on the field of battle a loud roar then the heroic arjuna quickly pierced the four steeds of his adversary with four fatal arrows shot from the gandiva sharp and straight and furnished with golden wings and pierced by means of those wetted arrows resembling flames of fire those steeds suddenly reared themselves and in consequence kripa reeled of his place and seeing gotama thrown of his place the slayer of hostile heroes the descendant of the puru race out of regard for his opponent's dignity ceased to discharge his shafts at him then regaining his proper place Gotama quickly pierced Savya's chin with ten arrows furnished with feathers of the kanka bird. Then with a crescent-shaped arrow of keen edge, Parta cut off Kripa's bow and leathern fences. And soon Parta cut off Kripa's coat of mail also by means of arrows capable of penetrating the very vitals, but he did not wound his person. And divested of his coat of mail, his body resembled that of a serpent, which heart in season cast off its slough and as soon as his bow had been cut off by parta gotama took up another and stringed it in a trice and strange to say that bow of him was also cut off by kunti's son by means of straight shafts and in this way that slayer of hostile heroes the son of pandu cut off their bows as soon as they were taken up one after another by saradwat's son and when all his bows were thus cut off that mighty hero hurled from his car at pandu's son a javelin like unto the blazing thunderbolt thereupon as the gold decked javelin came whizzing through the air with the flash of a meteor arjuna cut it off by means of 10 arrows and beholding his dart thus cut off by the intelligent arjuna kripa quickly took up another bow and almost simultaneously shot a number of crescent shaped arrows Parta however quickly cut them into fragments by means of 10 keen-edged shafts and endued with great energy the son of Preetha then inflamed with wrath on the field of battle discharged 3 and 10 arrows wetted on stone and resembling flames of fire and with one of these he cut off the yoke of his adversary's car and with four pierced his four steeds and with the sixth he severed the head of his antagonist's car driver from off his body and with three that mighty cavalry appeared in that encounter the triple bamboo pole of kripa's car and with two its wheels and with the 12th arrow he cut off kripa's flag staff and with the 13th falguni who was like indra himself as if smiling in derision pierced kripa in the breast then with his bow cut off his car broken his steeds slain his car driver killed Kripa leapt down and taking up a mace quickly hurled it at Arjuna but that heavy and polished mace hurled by Kripa was sent back along its course struck by means of Arjuna's arrows and then the warriors of Kripa's division desirous of rescuing the wrathful son of Saradwat encountered Parta from all sides and covered him with their arrows then the son of Virata turning the steed to the left began to perform circuitous evolution called yamaka and thus withstood all those warriors and those illustrious bulls among men taking kripa with them who had been deprived of his car led him away from the vicinity of the nanjaya the son of kunti thus ends the 57th section in the goharana purva of the virata purva section 58 goharana purva continued Ve Sampayana said after Kripa had thus been taken away the invincible drona of red steeds taking up his bow to which he had already stringed an arrow rushed towards Arjuna of white steeds 
and beholding at no great distance from him the preceptor advancing on his golden car, Arjuna that foremost of victorious warriors, addressing Uta said, Blessed be thou O friend, carry me before that warrior on whose high banner top is seen a golden altar resembling a long flame of fire and decked with numerous flags placed around, and whose car is drawn by steeds that are red and large, exceedingly handsome and highly trained, of face pleasant and of quiet mien, and like unto corals in color and with faces of coppery hue, for that warrior is Drona with whom I desire to fight. Of long arms and endued with mighty energy possessed of strength and beauty of person, celebrated over all the worlds for his prowess, resembling Usnas himself in intelligence and Drihaspati in knowledge of morality, he is conversant with the four Vedas and devoted to the practice of Brahmacharya virtues. O friend, the use of the celestial weapons together with the mysteries of their withdrawal and the entire science of weapons, always reside in him. Forgiveness, self-control, truth, abstention from injury, rectitude of conduct, these and countless other virtues always dwell in that regenerate one. I desire to fight with that highly blessed one on the field. Therefore take me before the preceptor and carry me thither, O Uta. Vesampayana continued, thus addressed by Arjuna, Virata's son urged his steeds decked with gold towards the car of Bharadvaja's son. And Drona also rushed towards the impetuously advancing Pata, the son of Pandu, that foremost of car warriors, like an infuriate elephant rushing towards an infuriate compeer. And the son of Bharadvaja then blew his conch whose blare resembled that of a hundred trumpets. And at that sound the whole army became agitated like the sea in a tempest. And beholding those excellent steeds, red in hue mingling in battle with Arjuna's steeds of swan-like whiteness endued with the speed of the mind, all the spectators were filled with wonder. And seeing on the field of battle those car warriors the preceptor Drona and his disciple Pata both endued with prowess, both invincible, both well trained, both possessed of great energy and great strength, engaged with each other, that mighty host of the Bharatas began to tremble frequently. And that mighty car warrior Pata, possessed of great prowess and filled with joy upon reaching Drona's car on his own, saluted the preceptor. And that slayer of hostile heroes, the mighty armed son of Kunti, then addressed Drona in an humble and sweet tone, saying, Having completed our exile in the woods, we are now desirous of avenging our wrongs. Even invincible in battle, it doth not behove thee to be angry with us. O sinless one, I will not strike thee unless thou strikest me first. Even this is my intention. It behoveth thee to act as thou choosest. Thus addressed Drona discharged at him more than twenty arrows. But the light-handed Pata cut them off before they could reach him. And at this, the mighty Drona, displaying his lightness of hand in the use of weapons, covered Pata's car with a thousand arrows. And desirous of angering Pata, that hero of immeasurable soul, then covered his steeds of silvery whiteness with arrows wetted on stone and winked with the feathers of the Kanka bird. And when the battle between Drona and Kiritin thus commenced, both of them discharging in the encounter arrows of blazing splendor, both well known for their achievements, both equal to the wind itself in speed, both conversant with celestial weapons, and both endued with mighty energy, began shooting clouds of arrows to bewilder the royal Kshatriyas. And all the warriors that were assembled there were filled with wonder at sight of all this. And they all admired Drona who quickly shot clouds of arrows exclaiming, Well done, well done. Indeed, who else say Falguna is worthy of fighting with Drona in battle? Surely the duties of a Kshatriya are stern, for Arjuna fighteth with even his own preceptor. And it was thus that they who stood on the field of battle said unto one another. And inflamed with fire, those mighty armed heroes standing before each other, and each incapable of overcoming the other, covered each other with arrowy showers. And Bharadvaja's son, waxing wroth, 
drew his large and unconquerable bow plated on the back with gold, and pierced Falguna with his arrows. And discharging at Arjuna's car innumerable wetted arrows possessed of solar effulgence, he entirely shrouded the light of the sun. And that great car warrior of mighty arms, violently pierced Pritha's sun with keenest shafts even as the clouds shower upon a mountain. Then taking up that foremost of bows, the Gandiva, destructive of force and capable of withstanding the greatest strain, the impetus son of Pandu cheerfully discharged countless shafts of various kinds adorned with gold, and that powerful warrior also baffled in a moment Drona's arrowy shower by means of those shafts shot from his own bow. And at this the spectators wondered greatly. And the handsome Dhananjaya, the son of Pritha, ranging on his car, displayed his weapons on all sides at the same time. And the entire welkin covered with his arrows, became one wide expanse of shade. And at this Drona became invisible like the sun enveloped in mist. And shrouded by those excellent arrows on all sides, Drona looked like a mountain on fire. And beholding his own car completely enveloped by the arrows of Pritha's son, Drona that ornament of battle, bent his terrible and foremost of bows whose noise was as loud as that of the clouds. And drawing that first of weapons, which was like unto a circle of fire, he discharged a cloud of keenest shafts. And then there were heard on the field loud sounds like the splitting of bamboos set on fire. And that warrior of immeasurable soul, shooting from his bow arrows furnished with golden wings, covered all sides, shrouding the very light of the sun. And those arrows with knots well peeled off, and furnished with golden wings, looked like flocks of birds in the sky. And the arrows discharged by Drona from his bow, touching one another at the wings, appeared like one endless line in the sky. And those heroes, thus discharging their arrows decked with gold, seemed to cover the sky with showers of meteors. And furnished with feathers of the Kanka bird, those arrows looked like rows of cranes ranging in the autumnal sky. And the fierce and terrible encounter that took place between the illustrious Drona and Arjuna resembled that between Viratha and Vasava of old. And discharging arrows at each other from boss drawn at their fullest stretch, they resembled two elephants assailing each other with their tusks. And those wrathful warriors, those ornaments of battle fighting strictly according to established usage, displayed in that conflict various celestial weapons in due order. Then that foremost of victorious men, Arjuna, by means of his keen shafts resisted the wetted arrows shot by that best of preceptors. And displaying before the spectators various weapons, that hero of terrible prowess covered the sky with various kinds of arrows. And beholding that tiger among men, Arjuna, endued with fierce energy and intent upon striking him, that foremost of warriors and best of preceptors, from affection began to fight with him playfully by means of smooth and straight arrows. And Bharadvaja's son fought on with Falguna, resisting with his own the celestial weapons shot by the former. And the fight that took place between those enraged lions among men, incapable of bearing each other, was like unto the encounter between the gods and the Denavas. And the son of Pandu repeatedly baffled with his own, the Indra the Vayavya and the Agnaya weapons that were shot by Drona. And discharging keen shafts, those mighty bowmen by their arrowy showers completely covered the sky and made a wide expanse of shade. And then the arrows shot by Arjuna, falling on the bodies of hostile warriors, produced the crash of thunderbolts. O king, elephants, cars and horses, bathed in blood looked like Kinshuka trees crowned with flowers. And in that encounter between Drona and Arjuna, beholding the field covered with arms decked with bangles, and gorgeously attired car warriors, and coats of mail variegated with gold, and with banners lying scattered all about, and with warriors slain by means of Partha's arrows, the Guru host became panic-stricken. And shaking their bows capable of bearing much strain, those combatants began to shroud and weaken each other with their shafts. And, 
Oval of the Bharata race, the encounter that took place between Drona and Kunti's son was dreadful in the extreme and resembled that between Vali and Vasava. And staking their very lives, they began to pierce each other's straight arrows, shot from their fully stretched bowstrings. And a voice was heard in the sky applauding Drona, and saying, Difficult is the feat performed by Drona, inasmuch as he fighteth with Arjuna, that grinder of force, that warrior endued with mighty energy, of firm grasp, and invincible in battle, that conqueror of both celestials and deityas, that foremost of all car warriors. And beholding Parta's infallibility, training, fleetness of hand, and the range also of Arjuna's arrows, Drona became amazed. And O bull of the Bharata race, lifting up his excellent bow, the Gandiva, the unforbearing Parta drew it now with one hand and now with another, shot an arrowy shower. And beholding that shower resembling a flight of locusts, the spectators wondering applauded him exclaiming, Excellent, excellent. And so ceaselessly did he shoot his arrows that the very air was unable to penetrate the thick array. And the spectators could not perceive any interval between the taking up of the arrows and letting them off. And in that fierce encounter characterized by lightness of band in the discharge of weapons, Pata began to shoot his arrows more quickly than before. And then all at once hundreds and thousands of straight arrows fell upon Drona's car. And O bull of the Bharata race, beholding Drona completely covered by the wielder of the Gandiva with his arrows, the Guru army set up exclamations of oh and alas. And Magavat, together with those Gandavas and Apsaras that have come there, applauded the fleetness of Pata's hand. And that mighty Kavarya, the preceptor's son, then resisted the Pandava with a mighty array of cars. And although enraged with Arjuna, yet Aswataman mentally admired that feat of the high-souled son of Preetha. And waxing wrath, he rushed towards Pata, and discharged at him an arrowy shower like a heavy downpour by the clouds. And turning his steeds towards Drona's son, Pata gave Drona an opportunity to leave the field. And thereupon the latter, wounded in that terrible encounter and his mail and banner gone, sped away by the aid of swift horses. Thus ends the 58th section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please like and subscribe to be notified of when new audiobooks are uploaded. Thank you for listening and learning. Shanti